So we'll just wait while people join us and we will now begin. So welcome to the latest of our Selwyn webinars. Uh, tonight we have about 400 people joining us from Britain and from around the world. And our guest tonight is Jill Whitty Collins, who's going to be talking about gender equality. And it's going to be an interview and, and a chat in which we'd love to have your Q&A. So do start the questions coming in by the chat facility and we'll put those to Jill um, as we go through the session, and we'll finish just before seven o'clock as usual. Now, um, before we start, just a couple of pieces of news from Selwyn. Um, the first one is to say tonight, obviously we welcome current students as well as alumni and friends. Uh, we have around about 200 students in residence at the moment. Uh, the majority are at home, sadly, uh, but we have around 200 here in Selwyn. And obviously we're fervently hoping that more students will come back and that we will have everyone here for the Easter term. And we're hoping to get as much normality back as we can, subject, of course, to health restrictions and what the government recommends. So um, having had uh, a Lent term that's been rather different in lots of unwelcome ways, uh, we really want to have a Cambridge summer and then get back to full normality in the next academic year. Um, the, the other thing I was going to mention was today has been an interesting day for the new library and auditorium for the Bartman Library and the Quarry White House Auditorium because uh, we've seen a scaffolding coming down on the lantern at the top um, and also on the clock, on the clock, on the clock tower. Um, so if you look, and I, I always encourage people to look at the college's social media platforms, if you look at Facebook, uh, search for Selwyn College Cambridge, or Twitter and Instagram, where it's just at Selwyn1882, you'll see the very latest pictures today of what the library and auditorium looks like. And we very much hope that's just a prelude to coming actually to look at it uh, later in the year when we safely can do that. So um, let's um, 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 get underway now and uh, to welcome Jill Whitty Collins, so an alumna. She became a big player at uh, Procter & Gamble, one of the major global companies. And she has written this book called Why Men Win at Work, which I read this week and I have to say I can highly recommend. Now, as a college, we've always been um, trying to be at the forefront where we can of gender issues. Very interesting, if you look back at the founding of the college, uh, the, the wife of the first master, Kathleen Litherton, was a pioneer of campaigning for votes for women and better social conditions for women. Uh, the first master, Arthur Littleton, also supported women's suffrage, and at least two early masters spoke in favour of votes for women when that was still a very controversial cause. Uh, we were one of the first colleges to admit women in Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, we had the first woman director of music uh, across Oxbridge and the first female head porter uh, in, in Oxford and Cambridge, though we also recognise we have a long way to go and still much more work to do. But the, the position in wider society, really what I think has driven Jill's book, is, is rather more concerning. Um, just to take um, a fact or two from uh, the opening of her book, if you look at the 2020 Fortune 500, that's the 500 top firms in America, um, it's revealed that only 37 have women CEOs, and that's 5%. And as Jill notes in the book, there are no black female CEOs in those Fortune 500 companies. Uh, not much better in the FTSE uh, in the UK, the FTSE top 100 companies, only 23% of women on executive committees across those 100 companies. And I also just noticed this week, our uh, former Ramsey Murray lecturer, Trevor Phillips, um, his company was behind some research showing now that there are no black executives in any of the top three roles at Britain's hundreds biggest companies. And that's for the first time in six years. So when you sometimes think there is progress, um, actually there really hasn't been. And even for minority ethnic communities in total, only 3.4% in the top positions in uh, those top 100 companies compared with 14% of the population. And interestingly, 27% ethnic minorities coming in as first year undergraduates at Cambridge. So that is at least some sign of hope for the future. But tonight we're, we're, we're mainly going to be talking about, about gender. And I'd like to um, welcome Jill joining us. Hello, Jill. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Great pleasure. And um, I really just want to ask you if you could give us a minute on um, your background and how coming to Selwyn. So tell us about you as an undergraduate at Selwyn. Yes, yeah, so I obviously, I was born near Liverpool um, in Warrington and I was, um, I went to mixed, uh, mixed school, mixed comprehensive school. Um, 
and was um, basically discovered selling when I was at, I was at Witness Sixth Form College and um, and found out about Selwyn and um, applied to Selwyn. Absolutely fell in love with Selwyn um, and was lucky um, lucky to be offered. I was interviewed by the wonderful Dr. Tilby um, and studied um, French and Spanish, um, French and Spanish there. Um, and obviously, you know, very, very, very close to my heart. Um, and probably the most interesting thing about um, me and my time at Selwyn is, and those who know me know this, um, I actually had my son when I was at Selwyn. So I was, I had my son at the end of my second year um so I was um doing my second year exams in a special room because I was too big a baby bump to fit into the exam tables um in the exam hall um and uh obviously that was interesting because that was not clearly planned um and had to navigate that as well as um as well as the degree uh, etc but you know, such fun memories of some for so many reasons, not least the incredible support that I got actually through that time um, from the bursa from Dr. Tilby. I mean, I was so, so lucky, so lucky to find myself in a place like that that was just, yep, yeah, fine, okay, we'll deal with this and this is what we'll do. Um, so, and then obviously I, um, by the time, by the end of my, my time, I'd racked up quite a hefty, um, nursery bill, uh, which, as you can imagine, as a student, Cambridge Day nursery fees are, um, are quite significant. So I was very clear I had to uh, go, no year out for me, I had to get straight out there and start my career and start paying off some debts. So you, you had a pretty rapid rise at Procter & Gamble and, you know, one of the really big global companies, as I said, and presumably a pretty tough environment, but you you rose through the ranks and got to very senior positions there. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I have to say, for many, many years, um, it, it was smooth. It was hard work. Um, I started um, as a brand assistant. Um, I started on a brand called Wash & Go, if anyone remembers that. Um, and I worked on, you know, incredible brands. I worked on the launch of Pantene. I worked on um, Olay, Max Factor, Head and Shoulders, um, amazing beauty brands. Um, and then um, went to Geneva um, after about 12 years to work on more global businesses, work on the femcare business, work on Always and Tampax. And I did, I mean, I, I, um, I went from brand assistant to brand manager to marketing director, to general manager, and then ultimately to senior vice president. And uh, for a very long time, very smooth. And one of the things, you know, I always say is, um, whilst I was aware, of course, that gender equality is an issue, and I was aware of things that were impacting other women, I personally didn't encounter the barriers for a very, very long time. Um, and, you know, I. I say, I'm ashamed to say something, I'm one of those women who probably um, didn't register it as, as important as it was and didn't realise that I, I was actually just lucky. And you say in a book that you actually use the phrase, I saw the light, and, <laughs> and you now say you are, quote, livid. That's quite a kind of transformation. So you don't really notice it and then you're livid. Yes. Yes, it did. I did go from a journey of uh, one of those women to live it. Um, I'm kind of making up now, making up for being one of those women. Um, but yeah, it was um, really at the senior vice president level. Um, so many, many years of, you know, good uh, 20 years uh, into my career that I started, I started to see it. And I, when I say see it, I mean, really witness it. Um, and experience it and really understand the impact of it. And, and the reason for that was quite simply that um, for the first time in my career, for the first time in my life actually, um, I entered a male dominant culture and environment. So up until that point, I had always lived and worked in a very gender balanced environment, you know, even up to director level, you know, if in any room we were in that company, um, and in my, you know, function, which was very much the, the marketing and general management function, 
very, very gender balanced and, and, until quite a senior level. And then suddenly I was looking around in meetings and it was, you know, 80% plus men, you know, hardly any women. And that was the first time that had happened to me. So actually at the beginning, I didn't even, I noticed it, but I thought, well, fine. I have absolutely no reason to, to think this will be a problem because I was naive and in my mind, man, woman, what does it matter? Um, and then I started to see the impact and I, I started to see the impact that this male dominant environment was having on me, that it was having on the women around me and that it was having on our performance and, and, and the contribution that we could make. And so that at that point, I actually became fascinated. Um, my response was fascination. What the hell is this? What am I experiencing here? What am I seeing? Um, I was doing, saying, being the same way I always had that had served me really well to that point. And it, I could just feel it, it, it just wasn't having the same impact. And I could see the women around me, they were shrinking versus the women they were outside that male dominant culture. So I became fascinated. I started to read. I started to read books and articles. And that's when I really started to understand. And, you know, I started to understand the extent of it and to understand that it, 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 this was not me, it wasn't the women I was working with, it, it wasn't my company, this was everywhere, it was impacting women everywhere, um, every company, every organisation, every country, every society, and you know, ev everything I read, everything I looked at, um, looking at the top levels, you know, the leadership levels in any organisation, 90% plus men and you know as you as as you know you quoted I think it's now actually seven percent of CEOs are women um nine percent of heads of state only 25 percent of parliamentary positions worldwide are held by women which which is really important, obviously, because that's where really critical decisions are made that impact all of us. And if women aren't represented sufficiently, that's a problem. 25% of what we see in the um, in the news, whether it's radio, newspaper, um, TV, um, is 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 about women and, and by women. So I just that's when I started to get livid because I thought, how how is this when women are 50% of the population and all of the data confirms, I don't think anyone would even challenge this, that women are equally intelligent, competent, they have equal leadership ability. I mean, there's stacks of data on this. So how is this? How can this be? And, and it's not right. And it's not good for the world. It's not good for businesses. And it's not good for the world not to have women represented um, in the room, in the meeting, in the discussion and in the decisions. Now, um, um, one of the um, things we should now look at is um, why that's the case. And you say the book is written for men as much as, if not more, for men than for mm -hmm. women. And, and I think it's important to say as well that you absolutely are not saying at any point in this book that you think women are better than men or men are better than women, but simply that there should be equality. So let's look at why that equality doesn't happen. And one of the things you say pretty broadly is men promote men. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I mean, that, that is absolutely one. There are so many reasons, you know, we'll talk about some of them. Um, and so many of them are invisible, subconscious, non-intended. They're absolutely, you know, I always say, um, I don't believe, I, I believe most men are good and decent and have good intentions. And I don't believe men wake up in the morning and think, how can I build the patriarchy today and destroy as many careers as possible? I don't think that's what's happening. Lots of reasons. One of them is absolutely that, you know, we call it the, the mini me syndrome where, um, you know, men will, will love, love their mini me version coming up, looks like them, talks like them. They recognize it, agrees with them. And, and they will promote that. And by the way, we can talk about it separately, but women who get to senior positions don't necessarily do the same for other women. That's a whole separate conversation. But yeah, there, there, are, there are so many dynamics and they're all interacting. But in many sense, the, the answer to why it happens is, is, is simple. Um, and it's as simple as the people who make 
ultimately make the decision about who am I going to give this job to, who am I going to give this leadership position to, who am I going to vote for? They choose, they choose the men usually, not because they're men, not because they're thinking I must choose the man, but because they genuinely believe that the man is better. The man is a stronger performer. The man will do a better job. And so the real question is actually, why do they think that? Given that we know that that, that may be true and let's argue 50% of the time, but it, it can't be true 90% plus of the time. So the real question is peeling that down and understanding, okay, then why do we believe? And it's not just men, by the way, it can be women too. Why do we believe those men are better even when they're not? One of the important points you make is that there's still a lot of inequality in um, looking after children or in household chores. And that can mean, for instance, that networking, that men may be much more able to network than women mm -hmm. can. And there's a whole set of different pressures on time. How, how do you try to accommodate that and take account of that when you're promoting or trying to run a company? I mean, I, 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 it is absolutely one of one of the big issues, and it, it, and it absolutely needs dealing with. You know, I call it, um, I call it the umbrella theory. You know, this concept. I, I always say, I've, obviously, over my, over my embarrassingly, men, embarrassingly many years, um, in my career, I've, I've mentored so many women, I've coached so many women, and, and I have to say, but I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that virtually all of them have said to me at some point verbatim, close to verbatim, this sentence, um, I believe my work should speak for itself. And so they are, and, and, and men, by the way, generally just know that that's, that this myth of meritocracy is just, you know, just doesn't actually work in the real world. So I think of it as umbrellas, you know, we are, as far as our bosses are concerned, we're working under umbrellas and they can't really see the work that we're doing unless we show them. And women, because they believe generally more in the myth of meritocracy and because they've got less time, tend to do to put a lot less focus on the networking um, and the self-marketing and, and uh, on driving visibility of themselves of their work and getting themselves known. And, and I do, you know, to, to your question, we cannot underestimate the time um, factor in this and the fact that yeah, there is absolutely, within women in general, there, there is an underlying dislike of, of networking marketing. It is a little bit of a dirty word for women. And I think that has to change because I think that's just not accepting the realities of how the world works. But that is a very, very real issue as well, which is that in general, and all of this is generalization, you have to generalize to talk about this, women are taking 80% of the unpaid work at home for the kids um, and in the family on their shoulders, even if they also have um, a paid job. And so obviously what that means is, you know, th that just leaves less time for this visibility, driving, networking, self-marketing, even if they have the inclination to do it. Because, you know, one of the areas we do have a quality is the number of hours, a day, hours in a day that we have, right? We all have the same. So a lot of women will say, you know, I just, I, I have got my deadline. I have to get out of the door and I have to get to this stuff. And one of the things that gives is networking and self-marketing time. So one of the big things I say to women, firstly, is you, you have to be aware, you have to be savvy about this because otherwise you're going to get really frustrated and you're going to see people whose work you don't think is as strong as yours getting the job or the promotion that you want. And the massive thing I say to companies is you need truly gender neutral parental policies. And by that, I mean, not just on paper policies, not you don't just say it's for everyone you really really mean it and when um, a man wants to take you up on those parental policies when he wants to take you up on paternity leave flexi work part-time work all of those things to take on more of his share of the responsibility at home you have to really make that absolutely welcome and absolutely accept it because 
I can't tell you how many men have written to me over this last year. I've talked a lot about, you know, how disastrous this pandemic's been, especially for women. So many men, in fairness, have written to me to say, Jill, you know what? I would actually really like to do, to do more but I have absolutely zero support from my employer. My employer accepts giving some flexibility to the women, but they absolutely look down their nose on giving any flexibility to men. There's, there is very, very deep sexism, I think still in the subconscious of employers that it is the women who do this stuff. And I think that's got to change. Yeah, we should say in, in fairness, of course, not all men win at work and, and the caring responsibilities yes. can be with single men, with parents or uh, gay couples. So it's it's not quite as gendered, maybe, absolutely, as, as yeah. the stereotype would have it. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you always generalise in these things. But, yeah, there, there are a lot of men out there who are not in that. They're not in that group. They are doing their share. And they're even, as you say, single parenting. So they're absolutely doing it. Um and, and, and they, need, they need the support of so many men uh, are writing to me saying, I want equality and I don't just want equality because it's good for women and it's good for business. I want equality for me. I want to have the right to do this too. The, the, the one thing that I really identified with in, in the book as a, as, as a man is, is you talk at one point about the way that men sometimes wing it and, and they see things as being a bit of a performance. And, and I certainly had the experience as a manager that sometimes you promote a man and he'd sort of imply he could do the job and go straight into it. Whereas a woman was much more likely to come and say, actually, you know what, I'm not sure you should have promoted me and I'm not sure I was the right person for the job. <laughs> and there is a real difference, I think, in the way that people approach new jobs and new challenges. And I would, you know, in all honesty, say there have been times I have felt I've been winging it a bit. And, and, and it is probably a, a difference of approach, isn't it, which you, you do identify in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, again, it's the generalisation. There'll be there'll, there'll be men who relate to the, you know, the, the, the argument about women on this, but it's absolutely true. You know, I, I talk about the competence versus confidence equation, and I think it's such an important driver of the issue. You know, we we all love confident people, right? We all love confidence. It's very attractive. It makes us tr trust somebody. If somebody's confident in themselves and they project that confidence, we're confident in them. We want to give them work. We want, we want to give them opportunity. And if somebody isn't, we're more res uh, reticent. And I think this is so important because, and again, generally, but generally women are less confident than men. And this starts very early in life. It starts at school, it starts with how we treat girls at school and what we expect from girls at school and what we teach them is important. Um, a lot of what I call perfectionist syndrome has developed at school, which is then when taken into life, um, this, this, this perfectionism and this super high expectation of in order to be good enough, I have to be perfect which is nonsense because it doesn't exist, generally sits, generally sits more with women than it sits with men. And so you will see this dynamic. I mean, you know, there's the famous study where um, it was found that men will apply for a job if they feel they have 60% of the skills and the experience, whereas women will need to be closer to 100%. You know, it, it all comes from these things. And it's just, I, I absolutely believe for me, I think men have got this right. I think this is one thing men have got right because I think it's more realistic to say, of course I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect. I, I, I can have a go at this anyway. I think that is a far healthier and frankly, you know, correct way to view life than to think, I'm going, I'm not going to put myself forward and I'm not going to feel confident doing it unless I feel like I'm absolutely perfect because I think women will wait, wait a very long time to do something. They'll wait forever if they're waiting to feel like they're absolutely perfect and absolutely ready. Joe, we've got loads of questions coming in, so I want to go to those in five or six minutes to make sure we have half an hour to talk about those. I'm, I'm interested to know that, that when we're talking about, about difference, um, what about the, the, the male, and they are largely male, entrepreneurs 
who really have changed the world. And I'm thinking now of Jobs and Bezos and Musk and Zuckerberg. And, and, and you say in the book that, that men are probably more, quote, risk-taking. And in a normal job, you say, actually, men risk-taking is fine. Women are more sometimes more analytical or, or, or look at a wider range of inputs. Are there some breakthrough moments where actually you need to be, I mean, I wouldn't like any of those particular people to come for dinner particularly, but they are, <laughs> are they different in some way? I mean, there is, again, there's evidence that um, men are generally more comfortable with risk taking than women. And that there's actually a, there's, there, there is lots of biological, biology based theories about adrenaline and testosterone and, uh, and, and, and all of those things. Um, but I think what's actually really interesting about this is that risk taking can seem quite attractive and you know quite sexy and we think oh you know he's a risk taker and he did that but actually a risk um a risk taker is not necessary or a testosterone fueled risk is not necessarily a good decision and there's been lots of research in you know hedge, hedge funds for example which shows that you know women women's funds actually perform extremely well if not better and one of the um, theories is that there are actually less um, emotional risks taken and there's more there is more analysis so I think there's just this danger of us you know coming to the conclusion women don't like taking risks which may generally be more true and thinking that's a bad thing it is not necessarily a bad thing not to take risks and I don't know with those individuals I don't know how much of their success is due to their testosterone field risks or you know how much of it is just due to absolute you know strategic brilliance on their part um but I do think risk taking is a um is is an area to be careful of for women and for men but we, we really have an enormous number of questions, so I'm going to get to the three really quick points. First in the book, I was kind of interested, you don't seem very keen on diversity training. I am not, I'm not against diversity training. I think my point is just it's not enough. Um, you see a lot of companies who tick the box um, with diversity training. They'll do the good old unconscious bias training and everyone will leave thinking, oh, isn't that interesting how biased I am? And then absolutely, it will make no difference. Um, and then, you know, diversity training, if it's, if it's done in the wrong way and it's not done sustainably, there is a lot of evidence that it can actually do more harm than good because what it does is, what it can do is actually bury the issue under the surface. Because if you don't really tackle the underlying issues and the underlying whys of, you know, the cultural reasons why this happens um, and you know the, the male dominant culture the confidence curtain issue the umbrella theory all of those things if you just run a training and and people don't really get it they don't really get that this is a massive opportunity for business that their business will be stronger if they fix it they don't really understand why it happens and they don't understand what to do about it what can happen is they can basically smile along and say, okay, I know my bosses need me to be, they want me to be on this, so I will say that I'm on this. And I can't say out loud what I really think. So what we do is we, we can just push the issue under the carpet sometimes. And, you know, I've certainly experienced what I'd call very polite cultures, where you would absolutely, unless you were looking very, very carefully, you would see no signs of avert sexism or, or lack of support for equality and diversity, but it is absolutely there under the surface. So that's what I mean when it's not that it's a bad thing, it's just it needs to be part of a whole holistic plan, which is supported by the organization and by the really top people at the organization, because they really believe that it's going to help their business and that they're going to be committed to it, you know, forever, not just for the, period of a training intervention you, you also don't really buy the argument that although you you very clearly articulate the damage the pandemic has caused to women in general you don't really buy the argument that women leaders have been better through the pandemic I mean, people say you know contrast Jacinda Ardern and Angela Merkel with you know Trump and, and Johnson you, you, you don't yeah. really go for that in gender terms no, I think it's been a really interesting debate, that one, hasn't it? People are always writing to me about that one. Um, 
I, I clearly we've seen some really interesting examples in the last year and we've seen some phenomenal female leadership and we've seen some terrible male leadership but I, I do not fundamentally buy the argument that women are better leaders than men and I deeply believe that both men and women women are capable of all leadership skills and approaches you know which includes really good listening and really strong empathy um, and fantastic collaboration with with a diverse team before making your decisions and paying the price later. I believe men can do that and women can do that. I think what we've seen more is the consequence of the leaders that we've chosen. I think some countries have chosen leaders, frankly, on the basis of, of, of their confidence um, more than necessarily their competence. And I think some have chosen very competent leaders and I don't think that really has anything to do with what gender they are I think um, it's really just more about the type of leaders we choose but this is the seduction of confidence you see this is why we've got to be so careful to look behind this confident curtain and say you know behind this you know bravado is there real substance here and is there somebody who's going to really lead our company or lead our our country and I, I I hope we choose we all choose our leaders more carefully in the future let's just say that okay there are so many questions that um we'll go through these really quite rapidly so that I, I can give you them fairly quick fire but um, um Abigail Matten Howarth who's a, a fairly recent alumnus says the Netherlands have just introduced a hard gender quota on board level appointments do you think legislative changes of that sort is the way forward so I have come to believe yes, and it and it, it took me a long time to get here. I would not have said this ten years ago. Um, I don't know specifically um, what target the Netherlands um, have have put in. I'll I'll come back to that because I I, I get frustrated with some of these targets. But I think um, in principle, you know, if I ruled the world, which isn't that a terrifying thought. I would, I would absolutely mandate and I would make it, you know, absolutely law um, that companies um, at board level and exec level were 50-50. Um, and I've come to believe that because very simply, I don't believe we will ever get there without it. And the reason is because of all these dynamics, the culture, um, all the subconscious stuff, it, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't make a manual intervention, this is just going to continue to be a self-fulfilling prophecy forever. So I've come to believe, actually, you know what, make the intervention and say we, we, we need to get there and we need to get there fast. And, and for me, it's very simple. Equality is 50-50, equality is you know. I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but I think that's pretty much where we are. And I get very frustrated when I see target setting that is, um, you know, recently, I think Germany, there was their mandating of one woman on every board. And this was celebrated as if it was fantastic. I actually find that I actually find that extremely patronizing to women and, and, I'm, and, and, and actually quite sexist underneath it is because it, it, it's got such a low expectation of women, hasn't it? If you if you believe that women are 50 percent of the world in equal intelligence, why the hell would you say you want? one woman on the board um, and that's not even mentioning the fact by the way that if you are that one woman on the board you, you're in an extremely difficult position because you're in a male dominant culture it's going to be extremely difficult for you to perform and contribute there potentially even impossible so so yeah I have come to believe actually that we need to force it I have OK, uh, uh, rather the opposite end of trying to fix it from Anna Philpott, who is an alumna and um, she's also head of school in Cambridge now. And she says, I've been on leadership training where the emphasis has been on women fixing themselves. Mm -hmm. Can women really make lasting change to this societal dynamic by fixing themselves? And if not, how do we fix the patriarchy? And she says, uh, by the way, there's one female head of school out of six and one female pro vice chancellor out of five at Cambridge and the male VC. That's great data. We're going we're, we're gonna to put that in the next put that in the next book. I think it's a fantastic question, and and you know, um, talk about this a lot. I am 
absolutely the last person who is going to say to you, women, you need to fix yourselves. You need to do this. You need to stop doing that. You need to talk like that. You need to dress like that. That irritates me. And I, I, I just, I don't like that um, at all. And I fundamentally believe that this issue is so deep and so strong that it, it has to be tackled by all genders it absolutely. And importantly, it has to be embraced and tackled by men because men have 90% plus of the leadership of the world. So frankly, whatever women do, until men start getting that, this is something we really should do and everyone's gonna benefit from it. Women are not gonna get anywhere. Having said that, I would give the, the caveat. I do think there are some things, I think everyone's got a role to play and I absolutely think women have got some things that they can do. And for me, it's not about how they dress um, or how they speak, but it is, you know, just being, you know, very aware from a young age of these issues, understanding what will happen, not being blindsided by them, being, being prepared, being ready. Um, and that includes, by the way, understanding things like the umbrella theory, understand that's just the way the world works. I don't think we'll ever live in a world where, you know, this human dynamic of people promoting and giving jobs to people who they see and know I don't think that that dynamic will ever change. Um, so I do think there are some things that women just, you know, just be savvy about the way work, the world works, the way people work. Um, there are some things we could do to, to help ourselves. Um, but fundamentally, honestly, most of the work here needs to be done by men and it needs to be done by men on the male dominant culture that when they look around, they find themselves in. A counterblast from Yorkshire, Jim Dickinson says, my experience is that women recruit women. This seems to be at odds with Jill's position, or is this only a problem that kicks in at a very senior level? I have not seen the data that women recruit recruit women, but I wouldn't I wouldn't argue I wouldn't argue with it. Um, it, it, it absolutely um, absolutely could be true. For me, I, where I've seen the problem is definitely to your question. Um, at the more senior levels and don't get me wrong I mean there is some fantastic sisterhood out there we've all you know we've all <clears throat> come across women I certainly have come across women who've really looked out for me and really supported me and I, I know many women have but I think we have all um at a senior level experienced um the senior woman who doesn't hold the ladder down for other women or shakes it so violently that she doesn't have a chance of holding on to it. Um, and lots of reasons why that happens, but it, it absolutely does happen. And that is a problem because, you know, if you think about it, if, if men have most of the leadership positions and it's extremely difficult for women to get any, when a woman makes it, and there are some women who do, right? There are, I call them the super 7% women, they do make it. When they make it, um, if they then don't support younger women, and meanwhile, the men are generally supporting their mini-me's, you're stuck again. So I, I absolutely do see it, unfortunately, too much uh, at the senior level. I know a lot of women are talking about this and a lot of women are, uh, are really pushing on it and really you know, calling out to those women. You get a lot of feminist phobia at the top women who will disassociate themselves from this because they've frankly been taught through the years that it doesn't look good for them and they would be better to be one of the lads so okay really interesting not. question from um sorry one of the things in the book is mentioned talk over women i'm sorry i just did um, but um, did caroline allen a question about self-marketing my experience has been that my self-marketing has been seen much more negatively than when men do the same in fact, I would say it's damaged my career by being seen as too pushy. Interesting. Now, obviously, I would need to, you know, understand the specifics a little bit and, you know, understand exactly um, what happened here. But it's absolutely one of the things that puts women off is they often feel uncomfortable doing it. And then when they do it, they think, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that went, went very well for me. And there are 
you know, beyond self-marketing, there are underlying dynamics here of how we perceive women versus how we perceive men doing exactly the same thing. Lots of women giving, you know, giving examples of having spoken in a meeting in a completely non-offensive way, but being called aggressive or bossy or pushy or all of those things. And that all has to do with, you know, what we're programmed with from a really early age in film and in the media on what women look like and do and what men look like and do. We're not used to some behaviors, but we've got to get used to it. Um, but um, what I would say about self-marketing, again, without knowing this specific case, is it's like anything. You have to be you. You have to do it your way. And I think sometimes what can go wrong for women is when they think, okay, I better do this. And they they sort of copy or, or, or do it the way they think others do it. And it's going to be inauthentic if you do it that way. I think you've got to find your own authentic way to do it. Authenticity is so important in the workplace. People can smell inauthenticity. They can smell when you're acting. They can smell when you're trying to be someone you're not. My biggest advice is be you, do you. Um, yes, yes, market yourself, but do it in a way you're comfortable with. One of the pieces of advice that you know, I was given at, at quite a young age, and by the way, I'm gonna give you the caveat, I was terrible at self-marketing, so um, I wish I'd read my book um, uh, 20 years ago. But uh, one of the piece, pieces of advice was talk about the work rather than yourself. So don't view it as I'm going to sell myself, view it as I'm going to sell the work. And that can feel much more comfortable and maybe much more authentic for you. Um, Jill, um, I'm going to read three questions together now. Hey, and, and also just, just, just pick, pick out the themes you want to particularly pick out. But um, Sue Clark, who's so in 83 says, I'm one of a tiny number of female professors of surgery, and we have exactly the same issues with women in surgery, and in particular in senior leadership roles. How do you think we should support upcoming women to overcome this? Um, Caroline Elliott says, one reason why women are more likely to be perfectionists or avoid risk is that society tends to be much harsher on women who make real or perceived mistakes, and women have to work harder to avoid messing up in situations where if it was a man, it would just be laughed off. Do you agree? And then um, a question from Heather Mackay. As a woman about five years into my career, I've had consistent harassment from men across a range of styles, sexualization, sexual harassment, belittling, and micromanagement. It's hard to maintain confidence in your own ability when facing these barriers. What would you say about women and what do they need to do about these issues beyond just acting confident? So many important questions um, in there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm going to do them um, all justice. But um, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll start with the first. The first thing, because I was fascinated this week. I saw that um, the tweet. I don't know if you you guys also saw it, where the um, there was the the professor, the female professor, and the male professor on a TV program, and he'd been given the professor title, and and she just been given her name um, and then when she raised it um, she was then basically told to shush she told her it's not important it's only a title um, and you know it doesn't matter there's you know what you said was important it's a classic classic case so yeah I think it's so important and for me you know obviously what I know is I know the business world um, that's 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 all I know. I don't know the um, academic world. I don't know the world of surgery. But what I can pretty confidently say is that we will share so many of the same issues and we'll share so many of the same drivers. So, you know, all, all I would say, you know, to somebody who has made it, you know, super 7% woman in that, in that context is you have such a massive role to play for the younger women. And, you know, it sounds like you're absolutely willing to do that, but role modeling for them, mentoring them, but also sponsoring them, you know, sponsoring goes beyond mentoring. They say, in, um, you know, they say mentors talk with people and sponsors talk about them. You know, what can you do? What, what contribution can you do to make sure that those younger women who are potentially, you know, not as obvious potentially the you know their competence is not as obvious 
behind the confidence of others what can you do to really you know help them and and lift them up so um it's it's really so important that we do that and by the way obviously that's not just women who can do that for other women there are a huge number of men out there who are doing this for women as well they're absolutely you know feminists as i call them who believe in women they believe in equality and they're working um they're working very very hard um can i just ask you a quick fire one which came actually from janice Zolan, the vice master building on that, who says, would you advocate a 50-50 rule in all professions, including, for instance, university professors and medical consultants? In principle, yes, I would, unless there was a, you know, a really clear reason that I'm not thinking about that uh, it, it, it wouldn't be relevant. Yeah, I, I absolutely would, because I'm not aware of any, any inherent difference in abilities i'm not aware of any reason why a, a woman couldn't be um, a professor of this as much as a, a man could be so so yes i would i mean i'm 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 really I'm, i've i've had my epiphany and i am absolutely committed and you know when i see the 30 percent target uh, and people celebrating that I, I then i get i get really livid why 30 why on earth why on earth 30 um so John I talk about the perfectionist point. So say again. There was a, the, the question about perfectionist and standards. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a that is a that is a really interesting question. And um, again, I don't have data to say that women are judged um, are judged to a higher standard, and therefore it's understandable they need to be more perfectionist. And I do personally believe that a lot of the um, need to be perfect is coming from the woman rather than from the outside. I, I absolutely believe that in most instances there are our own standards, not necessarily the standards of others. Um, but having said that, um, you know, I, I, I do see that, and maybe it's because we just have, you know, fewer women in these very highly visible top leadership positions, and therefore their mistakes are more obvious and visible, and maybe we do leap on them more. But I must say, you know, one of the things that I've said really, really strongly over the last few weeks, and, I, you know, I think it's so important, and I know it's resonated with a lot of people, um, and I feel very strongly about it. You know, we, we've just seen the first ever um, US pre um, vice president um, who is a woman. And obviously that is only one role, but it's clearly very, very significant from a role modeling point of view and what it shows young girls they can be. But one of the pleas that I've, met, I've made is, please let's not expect her to be perfect, Kamala. You know, we don't expect our male leaders to be perfect. We forgive them for many, many, many mistakes. And we must do the same with our women. So I do think that's um, super important. OK, we've got about 10 minutes left and I'm going to cram in as many questions as we can. So we'll keep it bouncing along. Um, Helen um, Nixieman actually says to us, it's interesting, all the questions for Jill seem to be from women. It would be good to hear the views of some men. Um, so I'll cite a couple of men. So Peter Basile says, wonderful talk. I'm 100 percent supportive of everything that might promote diversity. He does ask her the question. When someone asks for hard evidence that a diverse board is a better board, are there studies to prove this? So I'll give you a chance to answer that in just a second. I also want to bring, uh, uh, another man, John Grant. Is there actually too much concentration on gender because it's visible whether other traits of diversity are needed but are neglected? For instance, there are loads of women MPs, but precious few MPs who are scientists or engineers. But uh, maybe we could just ask, answer the question about, are there studies showing a more diverse board is a better board? There are so many studies. There are so many, and there are just the years and years and years and stacks of data showing that um, companies with equality and diversity at the senior level, at the board level, at the exec level, deliver stronger results. They deliver stronger top line results. They deliver stronger bottom line results. And I would say, if you haven't already, read, read the book, but if this is the question you're most interested in, go straight to the maybe men are just better chapter and there's lots and lots of data in there about how um 
uh, you'll be after the end of that chapter, you'll be like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. And it's important because I do think this isn't something that I can just sit here and say, and feminists can just sit here and say. It's really important that there is data behind it, and there, um, there absolutely is. And I do think, you know, the question about um, about broader diversity, of course, of course, um, of course. I mean, I'm obsessed with this. And I'm obsessed with this, not because I think it's the only important thing. I don't even think it's the most important thing. You know, is, is women being 50% of CEOs the most important thing in the world? No, there, there, are, there are women still being forced into marriage, um, abused, mutilated. You know, that there, there is there are much, much, much bigger issues than this. Um, I focus on this because this is what I understand because I think I understand this in a way that I, in a unique way because of my experience. And so I believe that I can help with this. And there are many other important um, equality and diversity um, things that need to happen um, that you know, they, they are just as important. And I, I personally believe, and I know Roger and I have taught this, I believe that if we can create a world where women can be as comfortable um, and as relaxed and perform and contribute and have equal opportunity um, as men. Um, I believe that that world, that culture will also be a significantly easier one for everybody to perform in. It won't answer everything, but I do believe it will go a long way. But yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I focus on this and I you know, make no, no apology for that, I know there are others who are doing brilliant work uh, elsewhere. Okay, Peter says a uh, wonderful answer, thank you. Uh, an interesting question from Claire Schnellman. You support a 50% balance target. To what extent would you also support that in currently female dominated professions, e.g. primary education, childcare, midwifery? A hundred percent, I would totally support it. And I do, I mean, I laugh and say, sometimes people write to me and say, hey, we're doing really well, we got 90% women. And I say, okay, you've got a dominant culture the other way. I mean, you know, if, if we really, really believe in this, we really need to believe in balance. We need to believe that everybody needs to be represented everywhere. And that's not, obviously not just gender. So yeah, absolutely. I, I would be as wary of a dominant culture uh, of, a, of a female dominant culture as I would be of a male dominant culture because they will be missing things. If you have a dominant culture, you miss the diversity of input and ideas um, and solutions and therefore you don't make complete and good decisions. So totally with you. There are so many questions. I, I would like to apologize to the people I'm not gonna get around to. We're probably time for two more. Uh, Marissa Dutherborough says to, uh, um, both of us, fabulous chat. I know women tend to face harsher criticism based on their appearance. What's your view on this? And there is actually a, oh. a bit in the book, isn't there, where you talk about dressing and so on. So have a go at that. Oh, this, I mean, I could talk for days about this. Um, such an interesting one because I, um, you know, I, I personally find it really, really hard to tell people what to wear because I just think it's part of it's part of our, our uniqueness. I, I'm saying to women on one hand, be yourself and bring that because that's how you'll succeed. And then on another hand, but don't wear that, 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 that doesn't sit, um, sit well with me at all. And I do, I subscribe to the view that boring clothes are a boring mind. So I, I find it very hard. However, I will share that the super 7% women that I interviewed for the Women Who Win at Work chapter, all of them, without exception, talked about just an acceptance that there is a work uniform. And I, I thought that was an interesting way to think about it because what they said was actually, this isn't a gender thing. There's a work uniform for men too. And there's a work uniform and, you know, just, embrace what you do your own way but embrace the work uniform and then and this is where it all gets a bit controversial um you know one of the women I interviewed who's you know CEO of, CEO of a very big company said you know just the words I don't like it 
but just the awareness that um the, do you want do you want men to be looking at your body or do you want men to be thinking about your mind because unfortunately they may not be able to do both at the same time that's a whole controversial area, area that we could um, we could go on to roger i did want to come back to the harassment question because i think it was important and i feel we i don't want to miss that because absolutely um i you know one of the things that i i say is i'm very focused on you know if in the gender pyramid i'm i'm focused on the top of the pyramid i'm focused on what i call luxury gender issues these are relatively luxury gender issues talking about you know why didn't i get to be ceo or why, why are women not prime ministers? Important, but luxury compared to the things that happen at the bottom. And, and you know, frankly, if women are being harassed um, and, you know, even, you know, physically abused and even worse, that has to be the number one priority. So hearing somebody saying that they've experienced this, this bottom of the pyramid stuff is always, always horrendous. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm really happy to follow up afterwards, by the way, with with, with the person um, who asked that. But but my my first piece of advice would be um, you not necessarily to believe that if it's in the workplace, the HR will solve this for you, because sometimes that doesn't work. And, and one of the pieces of advice I had from, again, the Super 7 percent women was, they all told me that they had experienced harassment at work and that not a single one of them had gone to HR and tackled it directly. They'd actually um, used roundabout ways of getting support. And I know many women who have, um, who have literally lost their jobs because they have raised this and the senior, very expensive man has been prioritized. So this, I hate this, but it, does it needs managing to protect uh, to protect yourself so really happy to follow up on that if i can be a, of any help in that area as well well heather who asked the question has just messaged to say um thanks for coming back to that and she knows it would have been an experience across the board so we can um certainly put, put people in touch and right. um uh, there's also an interesting functional question from luca newboat who says um is it possible to listen to a recording of this I'd like my daughter to listen to it. And the answer is yes, it will be on the Sewan website. And if you uh, just contact us, we'll make sure you can find the link. Um, I just want to ask one final question um, from um, Helen Scott, the commercial lead for Alliance UK and Europe and the Middle East on a group called Women in Meat Supplying Meat to Retailers, which she says is a very dominated male industry. A simple question. What would you say to your younger self now? Well, I... I as I said, I wish I wish my younger self could read read the book. I really do because I know and understand things now that I just didn't then, and I wasn't I wasn't prepared for them. I was blindsided because, um, you know, I think it's a it's um, a wonderful thing to be brought up in a way that you believe you're equal to any man um, and that you're up to doing anything you want. That is a wonderful thing, but the workplace is not necessarily set up to deliver so i think the biggest thing i would say to myself is get yourself informed about um about this issue and don't be arrogant jill just because you don't feel like gender inequality has got in, in your way at school or at university or whatever don't be arrogant there are women out there who are clearly telling you that it gets in the way so find out about it talk to them find out about the issues find out what happens find out why it happens and get yourself ready for it and you know i i i think that i would have done some things better if i had but i think more importantly i would have started talking about this sooner and i would have started hopefully contributing to the fix and the progress sooner which is at the end of the day much much more important than my own personal experience which i've been lucky has been relatively still a very positive one jill it's a, a very good point to end and i i would just like to thank you on behalf of everyone who's been i'm sure enthralled tonight by 
the conversation and and we're just enormously grateful and thank you for being a uh, another illustrious member of the sewing community and we're very proud of all our all our alumni um i, I will do my usual um plug for events coming up so actually there is a procter and gamble connection and uh with our, our next guest who's tim davy uh who also worked for procter and gamble he's now director general of the bbc um he and jill know each other and i, I think you overlapped slightly at um so in so did. i was at png because of because of, because he told me all about it so it's just that networking Thanks you see it gets everywhere um so that's uh, <laughs> next thursday thursday the 18th of February again at six o'clock and then on Thursday the 25th of February uh, we have Nigel Newton um, and a surprise guest as well I think uh, who will be talking about publishing and the Bloomsbury Empire which was based partly on the uh, discovery of Harry Potter and JK Rowling so lots to come up and we would thank you hugely there are as ever lots of appreciative comments coming in I'll just um, read a few of them Alva Hoburn thanks so much it was brilliant uh, Marianne Janna, thank you, fascinating and important. Looking forward to reading the book. Sarah Stanford, thanks, fascinating and thought provoking. Claire Roche, really great talk. Uh, would appreciate a link to be able to share with my family. Kath Elliston, thank you so much, Jill. Uh, Ulrika Michael, great. Uh, Dorothea Moser, thank you, that was empowering. And they're all uh, whizzing in at a rate of knots. So uh, much appreciation you. from I'm people I'm saying a thank here. you from a feminist as well. I love, I love that. This is, we, we need you, we need you guys. Thank you so much, um, Roger, for, for inviting me. You know, I'm so proud to, um, to be able to do it. So happy to be able to do it. And thank you for the brilliant questions really brilliant questions from you and also from the um the audience you made me think about a few things which is fantastic okay that's brilliant just tell us jill um the website that you can get in touch with you via your website or your own twitter yeah, so as well you but... can, um i have my website jillwittercollins.com you can also find me on linkedin um jillwittercollins i'm on instagram i'm on twitter um and yes just just ping me if you um if you want to connect it would be fantastic to be in touch i think you'll get quite a response to that so thank you for the invitation <laughs> Wonderful. and um, More thanks to everybody for friends. i love that thanks to everybody for being with us tonight we'll see you next thursday for tim davies thanks everybody goodbye thank you